Hello, my name is Elaine Tintoni, and I am the lead online math instructor at Itawamba Community College, and I'm going to be taking you through this co-requisite college algebra course. The first five sections that we're going to do together are some introductory material to get you caught up on some algebra skills that you should have learned in previous courses. And after we complete these first five sections, you'll join up with the regular college algebra class and you'll be doing all the same things that the regular college algebra class does at that point. So let's get started here in section R3 of your textbook. This is titled Polynomials, but it's really for us mostly a review of the exponent rules. And we also will review a little bit about how to add and subtract polynomials and how to multiply polynomials. Here we go. So first, like I said, we want to review our exponent rules a little bit. We're going to just pick up the first four exponent rules here, and you'll see the rest of the exponent rules in a later video. But I hope that you remember from a previous algebra course the product rule for exponents, and that would be that any base raised to an exponent times the same base raised to another exponent if you want to do that multiplication, you can keep the base the same and just add the exponents. So a to the m times a to the n equals a to the m plus n. In other words, if your two factors both have the same base, then to do the multiplication, all you have to do is add the exponents. Here's an example of that. Suppose we have x to the third times x to the fifth. Well, here you see that both of these factors have the same base. So to multiply these together, we keep the base the same, and we add the exponents. 3 plus 5 is 8. And let's see another one with maybe numbers instead of variables. So here we have 2 to the 4th times 2 to the 6th. So notice that the rule says that if the bases are the same, then you add the exponents, but you keep the base the same. So 2 to the 4th times 2 to the 6th, if we want to multiply here, we'll keep the base the same, but we'll add the exponents. So 4 plus 6 is 10. And the, notice that the base stays the same. It's a common mistake for students to see this multiplication symbol and say 2 times 2 is 4, and you want to change the base to 4. But notice that we need to leave the base the same because what's happening here is we have four twos all multiplied together times six more twos all multiplied together. If you visualize that, what you really have is ten twos all multiplied together. So you wouldn't want to say four to the tenth because you don't have ten fours all multiplied together. You have ten twos all multiplied together. So that's two to the tenth. And now let's pick up power rule number one, our book has three rules that deal with powers, and so they just called them power rule one, two, and three. The first one says that if we have any base raised to any power, and that quantity gets raised to another power, then we can simplify this by multiplying the exponents together. So we keep the base the same, but we multiply the exponents. So a to the m raised to the n can be simplified as a to the m times n. Now students are always getting these two rules mixed up, the product rule and the power rule. Notice that the first one allows us to do multiplication, but to do the multiplying, we add the exponents. The second one allows us to raise power to power, but to do the raising, we multiply the exponents. So I want you to take a really good look and notice how these two expressions look different. When it's base times base, we add the exponents, but when it's power to power, we multiply the exponents. So let's get an example here. Here we have x to the third raised to the fifth. So it's power to power, so I'm going to multiply the exponents, and it's going to be, of course, x to the 15th. And another example would be 2 to the fourth, raised to the sixth, so it's power to power, so we're going to say it's two to the four times six, that's two to the twenty-fourth. Okay, notice the difference between these, x to the third times x to the fifth is x to the eighth. 
but x to the third raised to the fifth is x to the fifteenth. Two to the fourth times two to the sixth is two to the tenth, but two to the fourth raised to the sixth is two to the twenty-fourth. So notice the difference between them. This top line is the product rule, this bottom line is the power rule. Now let's get power rule number two. Power rule number two says if you have factors all multiplied together and all being raised to the same power, you can apply that power to each factor inside the parentheses. So a b raised to the m power can be written out as a to the m times b to the m. See, each factor can have its own copy of the exponent. And here's an example of that type of problem. Here I have 3x to the third, y to the fifth, all raised to the second power. So this power rule number two tells me that I can apply this outside power to each factor from inside the parentheses. So that's going to be 3 to the second times x to the third to the second times y to the fifth to the second. And now we can go back and simplify this using our power rule. So 3 to the second, of course, you know is 9 x to the third to the second, see this is a power rule situation, so we would multiply the exponents. So this is going to be x to the sixth, and then y to the fifth raised to the second is going to be y to the tenth. And let's pick up power rule number three here. So instead of a multiplication, if you have a quotient, so you have a divided by b, and that's raised to a power, you can apply this outside power to both the top and the bottom. So that would be a to the m over b to the m. And here is an example of that. Here I have 4x squared over 5y to the fourth, all raised to the third power. So see how it looks exactly like power rule number three? We have a fraction raised to an outside power. And so power rule number three tells us that we can apply this outside power to each factor inside the parentheses. So I'm going to say that's 4 to the third times x squared to the third over 5 to the third times y to the fourth to the third. And then we can just simplify each one of these. 4 to the third would be 4 times 4 times 4, that is 64. x squared to the third would be x to the sixth. In the denominator, 5 to the third would be 5 times 5 times 5, that's 125. And y to the fourth to the third would be y to the twelfth, because 4 times 3 is 12. So there is a quick review of four of our exponent rules. Now let's do a couple of examples together. Here's a really simple one. This says y to the fourth times y to the seventh. Well, we recognize that this is a multiplication problem, and so we're going to need the product rule. And so we know that if the bases are the same, we can do this multiplication by adding the exponents. So this answer is going to be y to the 11, because 4 plus 7 is 11. And here on part b, we have 6z to the 5th times 9z to the 3rd times 2z to the 2nd. So, of course, this is a multiplication, and we can do this using the product rule. Now, you don't have to write out the next step I'm going to write out, but I'm going to do it just to make sure that everybody understands, because sometimes people get confused because they're not sure what to do since the z's are all spread out. But remember, we have the commutative property, which says we can rearrange these factors in any convenient order. So I could write this as 6 times 9 times 2, times z to the fifth, z to the third, z to the second. So that would certainly be allowed. Now we can multiply these three numbers together. 6 times 9 is 54, and 54 times 2 would be 108. And now we can see that we can use the product rule to multiply these three bases together. z to the fifth times z to the third times z to the second. Each of these has the same base, so we can apply the product rule. So we can just say 5 plus 3 is 8, and 8 plus 2 is 10. So the final result here would be z to the 10th. So multiplying all three of these together, we get 108z to the 10th. 
Now let's practice using our power rules. Here we have 5 to the third raised to the second. So notice that this is power to power. And so we know that when it's power to power, we multiply the exponents. So this will give us 5 to the sixth. Now don't worry about multiplying this out. 5 to the sixth would be 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. Times five. That would be a huge number, and you would not be expected to multiply that out. You usually can look for instructions in MyLabs Plus that say leave your answer in exponential form, and that's what we're going to do here. On part B, we have 3 to the 4th x squared all raised to the 3rd. Now, this is an example of power rule number 2 because we have multiple factors inside the parentheses, but they're all being raised to the 3rd power. So power rule number two tells us that we can apply this outside power to each factor from the inside. So that's going to be 3 to the fourth raised to the third times x squared raised to the third. Now because this is power to power, we multiply the exponents and this will give us 3 to the twelfth. And this also is power to power, so that's going to give us x to the sixth. 2 times 3 is 6. And again, 3 to the twelfth would be 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. You'd need 12 of them there, and if you multiplied that all out, it would be a huge number. So something that size we typically leave just in exponential form. But again, watch for instructions in MyLabs Plus that say leave your answer in exponential form. Here are a couple more examples. Here we have 2 to the 5th over b to the 4th, all raised to the 3rd. So this is an example of power rule number 3. And power rule number three tells us that we can apply this outside exponent to both the top and the bottom. So that would be 2 to the 5th raised to the 3rd over b to the 4th raised to the 3rd. And this now is an example of power rule number 1. So 5 times 3 is 15. So this numerator will become 2 to the 15th. And the bottom is also an example of power rule number 1. So this denominator is going to become b to the 12th because 4 times 3 is 12th. In part D, we have another example that's going to require us to use power rule number 3, and really, if you think about it, power rule numbers 2 and 1 as well. So first, I'm going to use power rule number 3 to apply this outside exponent to every factor in the top and every factor in the bottom. So that's going to be negative 2 to the 5th times m to the 6th to the 5th over t to the 2nd to the 5th times z to the 5th. And now we need to simplify each of these. Now negative 2 to the 5th is actually small enough that we can work that out. So in this case, we don't want to leave this in exponential form. We'll go ahead and work it out. Negative 2 to the 5th power would be negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, you know, 5 of them. And that looks like a large number, but it's not going to be. You'll see once we get it worked out. First of all, let's deal with the signs. Five negative signs all multiplied together is going to come up negative because, you know, every pair of negatives multiplies together to give you a positive, but here we have an odd negative that's not part of a pair. So the final result here will be negative, and now let's work on the number. 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, 8 times 2 is 16, and 16 times 2 is 32. And you really don't have to write that out, so that's why I wrote it up here kind of like scratch work but that is something that you could just do mentally so now let's come down here where our problem was and let's get our final answer so now we know negative 2 to the fifth is negative 32 we know m to the sixth to the fifth is going to be m to the 30th in the denominator we know t squared to the fifth is going to be t to the tenth and then we have z to the fifth as well so this is the final simplified form for this answer. Now we do have one more rule that we want to pick up in this section, and this is the zero exponent rule. For any non-zero real number a, we can always know that a to the zero power is going to be equal to one. Anything raised to the zero power is one. The only catch with this rule is that you have to be careful about what exactly is being raised to the zero power. So every time you see a zero, don't just assume the answer is one, but you know think about what's going on here. So let's look at several different 
examples where we see zero exponents. Here I have four to the zero power. Now we know from our rule that anything to the zero power is one, so four to the zero power is certainly equal to one. And here in part B, I have negative four in parentheses to the zero power. So again, anything to the zero power is one. And what's being raised to the zero power here? This whole thing in parentheses. So anything to the zero power is one. So in part B, the answer is one. On part C, notice that the parentheses are missing. So in this case, when you ask yourself what's being raised to the zero power here, the answer is not negative four. The answer here is that four is being raised to the zero power. So we have negative four to the zero power. Now again, anything to the zero power is one, but this negative is sitting out front. So negative four to the zero power is gonna be negative one. So notice that four to the zero power is one, but this negative did not get raised to the zero power because this negative is not being affected by that exponent. If you want the negative to be affected by the exponent, you need it in parentheses. That's the difference between the problem we see in part B and the problem we see in part C. So I want you to like pause and think about that and get it clear in your head. Anything to the zero power is one in the case where we have the parentheses, everything is being raised to the zero power, so it's all equal to one. But here, there are no parentheses, so all that's getting raised to the zero power is just the base, which is four. The negative is sitting out front, so negative four to the zero power is negative one. Down here in part D, you might be tempted to say negative times negative is positive, and you might be tempted to make that positive, but remember that order of operations requires us to simplify all exponents first, and then we can deal with multiplication. So what's being raised to the zero power here? Just the parentheses. So anything raised to the zero power is one. So what we have here in parentheses being raised to the zero power is gonna become one, but again, we have this negative sitting outside. So this final answer is gonna be negative one. And then in part E, we have 7r, all raised to the zero power. So of course, anything raised to the zero power is one, and that's all being raised to the zero power, so that's all one. Now this is not part of the example, but I just want to contrast this for you. Notice that in part E, we did have parentheses. What would this problem look like if we didn't have parentheses? So what if it was just 7r to the zero? Well, in that case, what's being raised to the zero power is just r. So r to the zero power is one, and we're going to get here seven times one, which of course is seven. So the parentheses definitely do make a difference, and you need to pay close attention to that. Now that we've got our exponent rules nailed down a little bit, we can go on and apply those rules to some polynomials. So Let's remember what a polynomial is. A polynomial is a term or a finite sum of terms with only positive or zero integer exponents permitted on the variables. So you'll remember from previous courses, the, the prefix poly means many. So polynomial just means many terms. And it can be either one term or several terms, but it's got to be just a a set number of terms. It can't be an infinite sum of terms. It's got to stop somewhere, and it can only have positive or zero integer exponents on the variables. So let me give you some examples of things that are polynomials and things that are not. If we had 2x to the third minus 7x squared plus 9x minus 4, that's definitely a polynomial. It's four separate terms. Notice that the exponents on the variables are all either positive integers or in the case of this constant, it would be a zero because you don't see the variable at all. So you can think of it like the power on the variable is zero. Another example of a polynomial would be one half x to the fifth plus two thirds x squared minus five. And notice that the coefficients can be fractions, but notice that the powers on the variables 
must be positive integers, or we can have a constant term where the power on the variable would be considered zero. Here are a couple of expressions that are not polynomials. 2 over x minus 3 would not be considered a polynomial because it has a variable in the denominator. 7x minus 2 times the square root of x is not considered a polynomial because we can't have this radical. 6x to the negative third plus 2x to the negative second is not considered a polynomial because remember the powers on the variables have to be positive integers or they have to be zero. And 5x to the two-thirds plus 4x to the one-third would not be considered a polynomial because we have fractional exponents here and those are not allowed either. So again, the exponents on the variables must be positive integers or we can have a zero power on a variable. In other words, we can have a constant term, but we can't have fractional exponents and we can't have negative exponents and we can't have anything else weird like variables under a radical or in a denominator. All right, now adding polynomials together is really simple. It's basically just combining like terms. To add polynomials, just combine like terms. And subtracting polynomials is also pretty simple. All you got to do is first distribute the minus sign to remove the parentheses, and then you can just combine like terms. Let's see what that looks like. Here are a couple of examples. So this first one is 2y to the fourth minus 3y squared plus y. That's one polynomial. Plus 4y to the fourth plus 7y squared plus 6y, and that's our second polynomial. But notice that these parentheses, all they're doing is holding the three terms together. So they're saying these three terms make a polynomial and these three terms make a polynomial. But really, algebraically speaking, they're not doing anything. There's no power on these parentheses and there's no coefficient that needs to be distributed. So we really can just pretend they're not there. And we can just combine like terms. 2y to the fourth plus 4y to the fourth, of course, is 6y to the fourth. Negative 3y squared plus 7y squared is going to be plus 4y squared. And then plus y plus 6y is going to be plus 7y. So here is the result of adding those two polynomials. And now let's look at part b. Notice here we have negative 3m to the third minus 8m squared plus 4 minus m to the third plus 7m squared minus 3. So it's minus all three of these terms. In this case, the first set of parentheses still is not really doing anything, but the second set is doing something important. The second set says we are to subtract all three of these terms. So I'm going to recopy this and distribute the minus as I go, and I'm going to lose the first set of parentheses because they're not necessary. So that's going to be minus 3m to the third minus 8m squared plus 4. Now be careful distributing here. Minus m to the third minus 7m squared, and minus negative 3, so that's going to be plus 3. And now that we've gotten rid of the parentheses, we are ready to combine like terms. Notice that we have negative 3m to the third minus m to the third. Together that gives us minus 4m to the third. Then we have minus 8m squared minus 7m squared. Together those give us minus 15m squared. And then we have plus 4 plus 3. Together, those give us plus 7. So that is our final result on the subtraction problem. In part C, we have two more polynomials. This time, the polynomials contain two variables each, but that's okay. As long as the powers on the variables match in every case, we can combine like terms. So, for example, here you see 8m to the 4th, p to the 5th. And in the second pair of parentheses, you see 11m to the 4th, p to the 5th. Because both of these terms have the same powers of the same variables, we can combine the coefficients. So the 8 and the 11 are going to combine and make 19, m to the 4th, p to the 5th. And then we have minus 9, m to the 3rd, p to the 5th, and plus 15, m to the 3rd, p to the 5th. Again, these are like terms because we have the same powers of the same variables and we can just combine the coefficients. So negative 9 plus 15 is positive 6. So we're going to write here plus 6 m to the third p to the fifth. 
Now on part D, notice that we have coefficients in front of these parentheses, and we do have a minus sign here. So before we can actually do this subtraction, we will need to distribute these coefficients to remove the parentheses. So here we go. 4 times x squared is going to be 4x squared. 4 times minus 3x is going to be minus 12x. And 4 times 7 is going to be 28. And then we're distributing the minus 5. So minus 5, 2x squared is going to be minus 10x squared. Negative 5 times negative 8x is going to make plus 40x. And negative 5 times negative 4 is going to make plus 20. And now we are ready to combine our like terms. So we have a couple of x squared terms here. 4x squared and minus 10x squared together make minus 6x squared. And then we have a couple of x terms here. So minus 12x and plus 40x makes plus 28x. And then plus 28 and plus 20 together make plus 48. So that's the final result on this example. Now we'll move on to multiplication. So to multiply polynomials, what you've got to do is each term in the first polynomial must be multiplied by each term in the second polynomial. And when you get that all done, then you can combine like terms. And we'll look at a multiplication example here. So we have 3p squared minus 4p plus 1. And that's all going to be multiplied by p to the third plus 2p minus 8. So what we're going to do is very carefully, just one at a time, distribute 3p squared, and then we'll distribute the minus 4p, and then we'll distribute the 1. So 3p squared times p to the third is going to be 3p to the fifth. 3p squared times 2p is going to be 6p to the third. And 3p squared times minus 8 is going to be minus 24p squared. Now we go back and distribute the minus 4p. So minus 4p times p to the third is minus p to the fourth. Minus 4p times 2p is minus 8p squared. And minus 4p times minus 8 is plus 32p. And now distributing the 1, 1 times p to the third is p to the third. 1 times 2p is 2p, and 1 times negative 8 is minus 8. And now we have this big long string of terms, and we just need to combine our like terms. And what I like to do is mark out terms as I go, so I don't accidentally overlook anything. Okay, first I have 3p to the fifth, and I look through my list, and I don't see any other fifth powers, so I'm going to put that one down first and mark it out. And now the next smaller power would be the fourth power. And, you know, it's kind of optional to keep your powers in order, but it does help make these things easier to read and easier to use. So I like to go from biggest to smallest, and you'll notice all the textbooks do that. And so we've done p to the fifth. Now let's do p to the fourth. Here I see minus 4p to the fourth, and I don't see any other fourth powers. So I'm going to copy that one next and mark it out. Now let's do our p to the third terms. So here I see 6p to the third, and I also see 1p to the third. Together those make 7p to the third. So I'll copy that down here and mark those two out. And then we'll do our second powers. So we've got minus 24p squared and minus 8p squared. Together they make minus 32p squared. We'll mark those out. And then the p terms are 32p and 2p. Together they make 34p. And mark those out. And then the last one is this minus 8. So now they're all in order. It makes it really easy to read and compare to other polynomials if you have more stuff going on. But this is how you multiply. Just distribute one at a time and then combine like terms. Now, frequently, if we're just doing binomial times binomial, we'll use the acronym FOIL to remember how to multiply. And you remember that FOIL stands for first, outer, inner, last. So that's just reminding us that we do first times first, outer times outer, inner times inner, and last times last. And that way you don't accidentally forget to do any of the multiplying steps but this is no different from the distributing, so if you prefer to think of it as distributing, of course, that's certainly valid. Now, if there is a monomial in front of the parentheses, it's easiest to multiply the binomials together first, 
and then distribute the monomial at the end. And that's because if you distribute anything into that first set of parentheses, it's going to make the numbers or the exponents bigger, sometimes both. It depends on what the monomial is. So in order to keep the numbers as small as possible while you're using the FOIL method, do the FOIL method first and then distribute the monomial. Let's look at a few examples together. Here we have 6m plus 1 times 4m minus 3. So you could think of it as distributing the 6m and then distributing the 1, but we're choosing just to think through the FOIL method this time because we do have binomial times binomial. Remember, a binomial just means two terms. So we have two terms times two terms. All right, first times first is going to be 6m times 4m. That's going to be 24m to the second. Outer times outer is going to be 6m times minus 3. That's going to be minus 18m. Inner times inner is going to be 1 times 4m. That's 4m, of course. And last times last is going to be minus 3. So now we've done all the multiplying, and all that's left is to combine the like terms, which we usually find in the middle. So negative 18m plus 4m is going to be minus 14m. So our final answer is 24m squared minus 14m minus 3. Here in part B, we have another binomial times a binomial, so we'll use the FOIL method here as well. First times first is 2x times 2x, that's going to be 4x squared. Outer times outer is going to be 2x times minus 7, that's minus 14x. Inner times inner is 7 times 2x, that's going to be plus 14x. And last times last is going to be 7 times negative 7, so that's minus 49. Now notice here when we add our two like terms in the middle, they are going to add up to 0. So our final answer is going to be 4x squared plus 0, which we will not write, and then minus 49. And here on part C, we have r squared times 3r plus 2 times 3r minus 2. And this is one of those examples where we have two binomials being multiplied together, but we also have this monomial out front. Now, it is my advice to you that you leave this alone until the last step. So I'm going to keep the r squared, and I'm going to put down parentheses, and I'm going to do this multiplication and put the results of this multiplication inside the parentheses. So first times first would be 3r times 3r. That's 9r squared. Outer times outer will be minus 6r. Inner times inner will be plus 6r. And last times last will be 2 times minus 2. That's going to be minus 4. Notice that the two middle terms can be combined, and they would add up to 0. So that would give us r squared times 9r squared minus 4. And now we can distribute the r squared with the least amount of trouble. So r squared times 9r squared is going to be 9r to the 4th, and r squared times minus 4 is going to be minus 4r squared. Now let's look at a couple of shortcuts for multiplying special kinds of binomials together. One kind of problem that we see a lot is a sum and difference of the same two terms. Remember the word sum means addition, and the word difference means subtraction. So here we have a sum of x and y, and here we have a difference of x and y. So anytime you want to multiply together a sum and a difference of the same two terms, you could use the FOIL method, but you could take this shortcut. You could say first times first is x squared, and then last times last is going to be minus y squared. Well, what happened to the middle term? Well, let's take a look. If we do FOIL one step at a time, first times first is x squared. Outer times outer would be plus xy. Inner times inner would be minus xy. And last times last would be minus y squared. And notice that the two middle terms are exactly the same, but they are different signs. So every time you do a sum and a difference of the same two terms, that's going to happen. And these two terms are, by definition, going to always add up to zero. So why bother going through the trouble of writing them down just to see them add up to zero? If you know in advance they're going to add up to zero, just skip them. So that's why we see here the shortcut is to say x minus y times x plus y is just x squared minus y squared. And let's practice that, and we'll take the shortcut here. 
every time that we see we can. So here we have 5m minus 6 times 5m plus 6. To use this shortcut, you need to notice that you have the same two terms in both pairs of parentheses, but one is a sum and the other is a difference, a sum and a difference of the same two terms. And that way we know in advance that the two middle terms are going to add up to zero. So first times first is going to be 5m times 5m, that is 25m squared. Outer and inner add up to zero, and then last times last is minus 36, because negative 6 times positive 6 is minus 36. Okay, look at part B. First, verify that you have a sum and a difference of the same two terms. Here I have 4x squared plus 5y, and here I have 4x squared minus 5y. The only difference between them is that one has a plus and one has a minus, so our shortcut is going to work. First times first is going to be 4x squared times 4x squared. That's going to be 16x to the fourth. The outer and the inner would add up to zero, and then last times last would be minus 25y squared because we'd have 5y times negative 5y, so that's minus 25y squared, and that's it. Now here is another shortcut that will save you a ton of time and trouble on problems later in the course. So although I can't make you learn this shortcut, I really strongly, strongly recommend that you learn this shortcut because it's going to save you so much time later on. Here we have x plus y squared. And to multiply this out without going through the FOIL steps, you would get x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. That's kind of a little formula that you can learn. And let's see why that works. I'm going to show you using the FOIL step how we got this middle step. So you probably can see that first times first would be x squared. Like that's not a big deal. Everybody's usually okay with that. Now outer times outer would be x times y. And inner times inner would also be x times y. And then last times last would be y squared. So this is where the 2xy came from. Notice our two middle terms are xy plus xy. So that's why we got 2xy here. Now is this always going to happen? The answer is yes. Every time you square a binomial, by definition, the outer and the inner are going to be exactly the same. And so your middle term is always going to end up being double of whatever this times this is. So the way to remember this formula is to say first times first is there. The middle term is this times this times 2. So that goes here. And then last times last is going to be here. Let's practice using that shortcut. Now if you're ever not sure, you can just write this problem out times itself and do the FOIL steps. But I want you to try to get used to letting go of that rail just get used to using the shortcut and relying on that instead of the FOIL steps. So here we go. If we want to do 3p plus 8 squared, then we can say 3p times itself, which would be 9p squared. The middle term is going to be this times this times 2. So 3p times 8 is 24p times 2 gives us 48p. And then last times last is 8 times 8, so that's 64. And there's your answer. You see what's so nice about the shortcut is that you get the answer in one step, and there's no steps to do after that. It's just all one quick movement. Let's do one where the binomial contains a minus sign. So here I have 7x minus 5 all squared. So I know that the first term is going to be first times first, which is 7x times 7x. So that's going to be 49x squared. Now I know that the middle term is going to be this times this times 2. But notice this second term is negative. So 7x times negative 5 is going to be negative 35x times 2. Negative 35x times 2 gives us negative 70x. And then last times last is negative 5 times negative 5, and that's plus 25. So there is our final answer. And you just have to remember how we got that middle term, which is first term times second term times 2. And there it is. So this has been a really quick review of 
our first few exponent rules and how to do some addition, subtraction, and multiplication with polynomials. And I hope this has been a good introductory section for you. And I'll see you again in section R.4.